Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's uh, great to be here to be presenting a topic that is actually uh, dear to my heart, which is the engineer's failure to perform his uh, duties under the fitted contracts. It's dear to my heart because I'm actually my career is mostly uh, an engineer. And as you can imagine, uh, this topic may be uh, very difficult to cover in just the 20 minutes that is allocated to this presentation uh, because an engineer has a lot of duties in a fitted contract. Um, but we'll, what we'll focus on today is just the duty to determine disputes. And um, we'll first start with an introduction and uh, then we'll go into the engineer's duty to determine disputes, the contractual duties, and by contractual we'll take a look at the uh, 87 contract, the 99 and then the 2017, and we'll look at the, uh, the obligation and also the challenge and the reason for the perceived failure of the engineers um, discharging this obligation. And then we will conclude with the proposed solutions for this uh, failure. The introduction is comprised of two points. First of all, there's an overview of the engineer's general role uh, in the fitted contract, and then there's the perceived engineer's role in the construction industry. So the first one is the contractual one. The second is the perceived uh, roles of the engineer uh, from the practitioner's uh, viewpoint. So the first one, uh, the, in the 1987, the there's a particular clause, the 2.6 uh, clause, which uh, obligates the engineer to act impartially. So this clause is actually in the construction contract between the contractor and the employer, and the contractor is fully aware uh, that the engineer has an obligation to act impartially. And of course, uh, what that has done is that, uh, in practice, it's a conflict because the engineer is paid by the employer, and yet he's taking, a, taking on a uh, impartial role, almost like a judge. So, of course, it didn't work. Um, there's, there was a lot of disputes. Engineers were not discharging this obligation properly because of this conflict of interest. And that's why in 1999, the, um, there was... This is the last time you'll see the word impartial in the fitted contract until to date. So this clause was removed. And in 1999, in 3.1, it is clear that the engineer is acting on behalf of the employer. Um, and then, however, in, in 3.5, the engineer has a duty to be render fair determinations. There's this word fair. And actually, fair is also in the processing of payment certificates that he has to fairly uh, determine the amount due in payment certificates. And uh, this fair pro this issue created, creates really two problems. The first problem is that the engineer, according to clause 2.5, can actually initiate a claim on behalf of the employer. And here he is, if this claim is disputed by the contractor, he is the one that's going to det fairly determine this claim. And therefore, even if he uh, wears a different hat in determining this claim, then of course he's subject to criticism from the employer. How can you prepare a claim that is flawed in the first place? And uh, the second, of course, issue is the word fair. So what does fair mean? You know, there's, there's two schools of thought, in my opinion. The first school of thought is that fair means purely impartial, purely, uh, so it takes us back to the 87. But of course it triggers the question, if that's the case, then why was uh, that clause removed of being impartial. And the second viewpoint is that fair means uh, properly managing the contract with the risk allocation between the employer and the contractor with the agreed risk allocation. So by that I mean if a contractor agrees with an employer to a uh, risk allocation that is very, um, the contractor assumes all the risk, so it's an unfair contract, so to speak, then what is fair from the engineer to do is, is to uh, manage the agreement of the parties with this risk allocation and not diverge into principles of fairness and equity that deviate from this agreement. So this is another uh, school of thought as to what this fair determination means. Now, in, in 2017, this problem was resolved a bit by saying that you have in clause 3.2 that the engineer is still deemed to act on behalf of the employer. However, there's an exception. The engineer is not acting on behalf of the employer when rendering a determination. So in that case, there's an exception that the engineer is acting on behalf of the employer. And actually, there's a new word that is introduced in the 2017 edition, which is the engineer will uh, 
provide neutral, he's going to be neutral. So not impartial, not fair, although fair is mentioned also in the determinations clause. However, he is deemed to be neutral when determining disputes. So um, now going back to the second part of the introduction, which is the perceived engineer roles in the construction industry. So uh, in my opinion, there are two roles. Um, first role, that is the perception of practitioners in the industry is that this engineer is, regardless of what the contract says, he is a biased entity. He is like uh, an agent of the owner, he's the counsel of the owner, he's uh, administering the contract, but in the interest of the owner. So, so when a contractor goes into a construction contract, this perception is in, in his mind. The other perception is that the engineer goes back to the 87 edition the engineers actually should be impartial should be fair should be you know uh, like a judge and in both cases these lead to uh, the engineer is doomed to fail anyway because uh, if he is considered biased from the first place then khalas is not discharging his obligations if he's considered to be a judge or fair then and he's actually contractually he's acting on behalf of the employer um, he's still there is a shortcoming in his performance because he's not being uh, impartial. And I think actually for us practitioners in the industry, this really stems, this tension stems from, uh, from one thing. There's an inconsistency uh, between the construction contract and the engineer's role in that contract and the consultancy contract. I think a lot of times we forget that there's a consultancy contract between this engineer as a consultant and the client. So, and this consultancy contract is actually entered into uh, very in the very early stages of the project. And this contract normally says that the, in, that the consultant, of course, not, not called the engineer, the consultant has an obligation to um, alert the employer when there's a, you know, a, a potential cost impact, time impact, and more very importantly, that he has to seek the approval of the client with, uh, before making any determination to any dispute. Of course, this issue of seeking the approval of the employer, this alone will, will doom the engineer to failure because in rendering a neutral determination or a fair determination, there should not be influence from the client. So because of this tension between these two contracts and the inconsistency um, in those two contracts, this is where we have this, this perceived failure of the engineer. So um, if we now take a look at the, now we've, we've covered the introduction, now we take a look at the engineer's duty to determine disputes. So first of all, when we talk about determination, I think the first thing that comes to anyone's mind is a decision. So there's a dispute between the employer and the contractor, and as I mentioned, this, this, this claim of the employer may have been, this dispute may have been initiated by the engineer in the first place, because he prepared the claim for the employer anyway, but then, there's a dispute and then the engineer is required to issue a decision, a binding decision, right? However, this is not really uh, the role of the engineer that FIDIC has, has um, stated from day one. And actually, uh, the, uh, day one, by here I mean the 1987, of course, we all know that the first edition of FIDIC was actually way before that, that was in 1957. But the fourth edition in 1987, uh, the engineer had uh, before determining any, any not just disputes, any, in any matter, there is this magical phrase that you see here on the slide, that after due consultation with the employer and the contractor. Now, uh, in this slide, this is uh, clause 53.5, however, I've conducted a word search on this phrase and it's repeated in the 1987 edition 21 times. So the engineer, before doing any decision, any assessment, has to duly consult between the employer and the contractor. There has to be an effort that is conducted. It's not, you cannot just uh, issue a decision and that's it. This effort must be shown. In 1999, these 21 locations are all consolidated into one clause, which is 3.5, and it says here that the engineer shall consult, which is the word in 1987, but then there's another phrase that is added, which is in an endeavor to reach an agreement. So in this case, not only does the engineer consult, but he has an underlying purpose, an objective. He is striving, because the word endeavor is really, it actually signifies effort. So he has to be striving to reach an agreement between the parties. This is his goal. Um, and then in the case that this uh, effort is not successful, uh, 
then and only then, uh, first of all, if it is successful, then you see in the second paragraph, the engineer has to record this agreement and notify the parties accordingly. If it's not successful, then the engineer, then and only then can the engineer render a determination. Now, in 2017, you see this phrase in the 1999 contract that says that he shall consult with each party in an endeavor to reach an agreement. That phrase has been expanded to this. So actually the, the determinations clause 3.5 became an elaborate clause 3.7, which is divided into several parts. Uh, the first part being this consultation to reach an agreement. And then there's this, this determination process itself. But then let's look at this endeavor to reach an agreement and how it is expanded here. The engineer is now taking, I would think, as, as like almost like a mediator-like role. Okay, and you find some elements here. So, for example, the engineer, uh, of course, will consult, but he will meet with the parties jointly and or separately. Just like in you know, a mediation session, the mediator meets with the parties first openly, and then we go into caucus sessions. The engineer tries to, the, sorry, the mediator tries to, um, you know, tries to uh, discuss with each, uh, each of the entities trying to reach a solution that is in, in both of their interests and in which they both contribute to it. So here, in the same way, the engineer here has to meet jointly and or separately with the parties and shall encourage discussion. Just like in, a, in, in mediation, the parties are entrenched in their positions, their, the channels of communications are shut down, so this mediator, one of his roles is to try to open these channels of communication. The same way, the engineer here is trying to encourage discussion between the employer and the contractor. And not only that, the engineer is also a record keeper. So you see here in the last, the, the highlighted sentence in the last, in the, in the first paragraph, he, um, the engineer will record the consultation meetings in the minutes of meetings and whatever. And, and when there is an agreement that is reached, then the engineer records this agreement in a notice uh, of the party's agreement and the party signed to this agreement. So this is really this this explanation is for how he endeavors to reach an agreement between the parties. If agreement is not reached, then the clause goes into the determination and if a party is dissatisfied with the determination, so on and so forth. But just this just represents to you what the engineer's role really is in determining disputes. It is not to decide a dispute. The engineer actually is a problem solver. He's really trying so hard that to reach an agreement between the parties to minimize disputes. This is really the ultimate role of determining disputes of an engineer that I believe is not really uh, practiced uh, in the industry. So what are the challenges and the perceived failure? We've just seen now what was required of the engineer contractually from 87 until 2017. And so from my experience, first of all, the perceived failure is that the engineer normally makes no effort to consult with the parties. Um, the other thing is that the engineer, because of his contract with the uh, client as a consultant, he will consult probably with just the client and try to get the approval of the client and then he will just issue a decision without consulting with the contractor. Both of these cases are in deviation not only of the 2017 edition but of, of the 87 edition as well. And three and four is the engineer is normally cut up in con the contractual frame. So the engineer is just um, just looking in a very tight box of what the, the, the four corners of the contract and is not really trying to think uh, into like solutions. Uh, the engineer as the fourth point shows he's endeavoring, he's actually striving, he's creating an effort, he's trying to find a solution that is in the interest of both parties. So a lot of uh, engineers are very contractual and they do not even want to think out of the box and trying to find a solution. Because in the end of the day, this agreement is going to be like an amendment to the contract, it's going to modify the contract anyway, so it's like a settlement. Um, so these are, I believe, the perceived failures uh, in the industry. And now if we go to the solutions, what are the, so what are the proposed solutions? I think the first solution is that we must understand the underlying cause. We cannot ignore the consultancy contracts. So the first thing is the consultancy contract must have provisions that the engineer has to be impartial or fair or neutral. So and 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 we, th they must be drafted accordingly. So if the team that is drafting the consultancy contract, if say it's the business development or if it's the top management, they have to put this in mind. So, and, and also this would actually entail 
uh, uh, mindset shift for the employers. So the, the engineer is not there to defend the employer. The engineer is there actually to defend the project. So he's, he's acting in the best interest of the project. And it's in, the, it's in the interest of the project participants that the project that completes on time with as, as less within and within budget, that uh, legal fees are, uh, with respect to all lawyers, uh, are minimized, and that arbitration you know, expenses are also minimized. So this is, uh, this is where everyone is a winner. Um, the last thing is we have to consider if you're going to use a FIDIC contract, then it has to, it's subject to the FIDIC golden principles. Now, I want to ask by show of hands, has anyone heard of the uh, FIDIC Golden Principles that was issued in 2019 this year? Okay, so actually this is very important. See, this is what it looks like. In 2019, FIDIC issued the FIDIC Golden Principles and uh, I was in a FIDIC conference, attending a FIDIC conference in 2017 and at that time, they had already, there was a session, there was a task group that had already been formed to create these principles, and the leader of the task group was Hosni Maldi. He talked about this, uh, these golden principles. If you look at the 2017 edition in the, in the introduction, you will find a brief uh, count of these principles, but only this year has, has it been formally published, and it's comprised of five golden principles. Uh, the first one of those five, and which is the one that is relevant to us uh, in this presentation, is that the duties, rights, and obligations, and roles, and responsibilities of all the contract participants must be generally as implied in the general conditions. So what does that mean regarding the engineer? The engineer's role is to act in fairly or neutrally between the parties, and so this role must be maintained. The particular conditions cannot remove this role and impose on him an obligation that was not intended to by the general conditions. And what's, what's interesting in these golden principles is that twice uh, it is mentioned this, this influence of the employer on the engineer. So if you look at the right-hand side of the slide, um, it mentions that the, um, the engineer's uh, role as defined in the FIDIC contract is, of course, to fairly determine the disputes. But then it says it should not, this should not be subject to influence or control by the employer. If the employer disagrees with the engineer's determination, then there's a, D, there's a DAB, this is why they're, they're, they're there for. And the engineer has, the employer has the right to object to the engineer's determination, but in all cases, the engineer has to be uh, fair, has to be neutral in deciding disputes. Um, there was another reference, because this reference actually describes GP or golden principle number one. There was another, another reference that actually explains the reasons for this golden principle, and um, and it's it's uh, sorry it's okay it's it's not it's not in this slide but it mentions that the employer should not influence the engineer's decision clearly you know so it's mentioned twice in the golden principles as if to say that this perceived failure of the of the engineer's duty to determine disputes this is actually very well known worldwide and that's why gold, the golden principles they uh, mentioned this twice and that's why also in the 2017 I don't know if you've seen the slide before but it's very important. The engineer in 3.7 is not acting on behalf of the employer. Uh, he's, he's acting on his own volition to try to reach a neutral result. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you.